there are a lot of unknowns in Slay the Spire. When you start a fresh new run, you have no idea what cards you'll be offered, what events you'll encounter, and what bosses you'll face. But there is one thing that stays the same every single time you boot up the game. Up at the top of the spire, locked behind a heavy three-key door, is the game's ultimate challenge, the Corrupt Heart. This boss will put your strongest runs to the test, as it attacks your health, status, and deck. It's easy to think your run is untouchable until you're staring down 60 points of damage while frail, vulnerable, and weak with a dead card in your hand. Easy win, yeah? But this boss isn't some giant overtuned monster the developers added just to ruin your day. It's a perfectly balanced fight that's designed to be beatable without letting any build walk all over it. It forces you to prepare well in advance, and choosing to challenge it will shape your entire run. This fight is full of fantastic design decisions that make it one of the most game-defining bosses I've ever seen. So today, we're going to break down what makes the Corrupt Heart such a memorable challenge. Welcome to Finest Fights, a brand new series on boss fight design. We're going to be taking a tour of some of the most genius, creative, and iconic bosses in all of video games, to get a better understanding of what makes a great boss. So be sure to stay tuned for more of the Finest Fights. Before we get to the heart itself, we need to talk about how Slay the Spire works, and what it takes just to get to the boss. Slay the Spire is a roguelike, which means that when you die, you have to start over from the beginning of the game. Since the heart is at the very end, you need to beat the entire game just to get to it. This involves slowly building a deck that's strong enough to face whatever challenge is currently in front of you. It would be great if you could spend your entire run crafting the perfect build to beat the heart, but if you did that, you would just die in Act 1. As an example, let's look at the card Catalyst. For one mana, this card doubles an enemy's poison, or triples it when upgraded. This card is one of the best boss killers in the game, as it can easily push your damage into the triple digits. But if you don't have any way to apply poison, it's completely useless. On the other hand, we have the card Dagger Spray. For one mana, this card does four damage to all enemies twice. This card is extremely good at tearing down lots of weak enemies, which is essential in the early game. But once you get to the heart, this card will now be useless. At this point, most of your damage will be coming from Poison or Shivs, neither of which synergize with Dagger Spray. Okay, cool. So I'll start my runs by taking a Dagger Spray to beat the early fights, and then later, I'll take two Deadly Poison, a Bouncing Flask, and a Catalyst to kill the heart. Well, unfortunately, it's not that easy. Being a roguelike also means that the game is randomly generated, so you can never be sure what cards you're going to be offered. Slay the Spire isn't a game like Elden Ring, where you can craft a build to do exactly what you want. You have to roll with the punches, and figure out your strategy as you go. If you have the perfect build, this boss can be a cakewalk, and many of us have had runs that feel free. But what makes this fight special is that you have to try with whatever you've got. Sometimes, you miss that one key piece that would have taken you to the moon, and now you have to close the game out with a halfway finished build. These runs can make for the most exhilarating victories and soul-crushing defeats. There's one more hoop the game forces you to jump through before you're allowed through to Act 4. If you want to continue past the Act 3 boss, you need to collect three keys along your run, each one presenting its own unique challenge. To get the red key, you need to spend a rest site recalling it. Rest sites are powerful locations that let you upgrade cards or heal, and you won't be able to do either when getting your key. To get the blue key, you need to take it from a treasure chest. Chests contain relics that make your character stronger passively but you can choose to take the key instead and give up the relic. To get the green key, you need to fight a super elite. Elite monsters are already harder than normal ones, and super elites get an extra buff to make them even more dangerous. In order to get to the final act, you need to give up healing, upgrades, and relics, and hunt down the toughest fights. You don't have to beat the heart on every run. Just beating the Act 3 boss will count as a win and progress you to the next ascension. But when you really want to test your build or take on a challenge, you can take on the final act. Now you've made it to Act 4, the four-floor stage that leads to the heart. This stage is unusual because it doesn't have a rest site right before the boss. In all the other acts, this rest site gives the player a chance to heal before the boss, but the corrupt heart doesn't give us that luxury. Luckily for us, there's only one fight to go through before we get to the heart. Not so luckily, it happens to be the hardest elite in the game. I'm not going to get into the details of the Spire, Shield, and Spear fight. That's beyond the scope of this video but it's important to recognize the impact this elite has on the final boss. Any resources we use here, like health, potions, and single-use relics, won't be available for the heart, 
and we won't have any time to get them back. I almost never find myself actually dying to this elite, but there have been more runs than I can count where I'm so drained from fighting these guys that I have no breathing room against the heart. This fight ensures that you aren't always able to come into the final fight at full strength. Sometimes you come in haggard and sore, and you have to dig in your heels and carry on. I love how this creates variation in your attempts. You don't always get to start with a full health bar and pouch full of potions. Sometimes you start on the back foot, and these runs can be really memorable. Now we finally reach the heart. We have a build that's strong enough to at least beat Act 3, and hopefully we didn't take too much of a beating from the shield and spear. So what exactly are we up against? Well, the heart has six different abilities that all work together to kill you. Some of them synergize to put you in tough spots, while others keep you from relying on certain tactics. To start, let's take a look at the two passive abilities, Invincible and Beat of Death. These abilities are both active from the start of the fight, and last the entire battle. Invincible prevents you from dealing more than 300 damage in a single turn, or 200 if you're above Ascension 19. This mechanic prevents you from simply killing the boss on turn 1, or building up to one giant turn that one-shots the boss later. Certain decks are able to set up an infinite combo that wins most fights on turn 1. The funniest example of this has to be the Claw Top combo. If Claw or any other zero-cost attack is the only card in your deck, and you have the Relic Unceasing Top, which has you draw a card whenever your hand is empty, you can simply play Claw over and over and deal infinite damage. Invincible prevents you from simply cheesing the fight and winning before the boss gets to do its moves, and as we'll see later, the heart has a few more tricks to stop these one-dimensional strategies. Okay, so how quickly can we kill the boss? I'm trying to get this done as soon as possible. Well, at Ascension 0, the boss has 750 health and a damage cap of 300, which means you can kill it on turn 3, even if you miss the cap by a bit. At Ascension 19, however, the boss has 800 health and a cap of 200. Here, you can kill it on turn 4, but you have to hit the cap every single turn. This means that you have to survive the first pair of attacks on turns 2 and 3. There's simply no way to play an all-offense, no-defense strategy here. If your build has no way to mitigate damage, you're going to die in the first few turns. Next, let's look at Beat of Death, another mechanic that targets one-dimensional strategies while also putting pressure on any build. Whenever you play a card, Beat of Death deals 1 damage to you, or 2 at Ascension 19. This can get out of hand pretty quickly, and builds that play a lot of cards are heavily taxed. If we look back at our Claw Top deck, we see that Beat of Death presents a pretty serious problem. Because the build can't generate block, we end up taking damage every time we cast Claw. This can be mitigated by having a relic that gives us block, like Acubus or Ornamental Fan, but that adds another requirement to our combo. For more traditional decks, Beat of Death is unlikely to kill you, but it makes building up block a lot harder on turns where you need to defend against big hits. You need 70 block for that giant swing? Add one more for every card you play. Now, let's move on to the boss's active abilities. You know, the stuff it actually does on its turn. The heart has two attacks, one buff and one debuff, and uses them in a predictable pattern. It starts with a debuff on turn one, and then plays attack, attack, buff, cycling through those three for the rest of the fight. On each cycle, you won't know which attack is coming first, but that's the only unknown for the entire moveset. Let's start with Debilitate, the debuff played on turn 1. This move only happens once, which is probably a good thing for us. Debilitate curses the player, causing them to take more damage, deal less damage, and gain less block for the next two turns. It then adds 5 dead cards to your deck, each of which is slightly different. I know that our Claw Top combo deck already looked pretty doomed, but this is the final nail in the coffin. In order for the top to draw you a card, your hand has to be empty, which it won't be when you're holding a bunch of unplayable cards. It's important to note that these mechanics don't stop you from playing combo decks entirely. Setting up infinites is a totally viable strategy against the heart. Your build just has to be resilient enough to stand up to disruption. It's too easy to put together a flimsy deck that has one cheesy infinite and doesn't require any thinking whatsoever. That's what Invincible, Beat of Death, and Debilitate keep you from doing. But if you can put together a multifaceted combo deck that can set up infinites without losing to a few dead cards, you're actually pretty good at the game, and you can beat the heart. The heart is a perfect example of how to disrupt a playstyle without totally destroying it. It makes it harder for you to play infinite combos, but doesn't stop you from doing so. Of course, not every boss in Slay the Spire follows this principle. Time Eater only lets you play 12 cards per turn, completely shutting down decks that rely on playing lots of cards. As someone who loves to play crazy combo decks, I love the heart and hate Time Eater. 
The heart challenges me to be more resilient and build better decks, where Time Eater stops me from playing a certain way entirely. Next, let's look at the heart's two attacks, Echo and Bloodshots. Echo is as simple as it gets, a 45 damage single hit that's as basic as it is deadly. Echo is at its scariest early in the fight, when you haven't had much time to set up and a single big swing could end your run. Bloodshots, on the other hand, is a 2 damage attack that hits 15 times. This move isn't that bad on turns 2 or 3, but it becomes an unstoppable force as the fight drags on and the boss gains strength. These attacks can be overwhelming, but luckily for us, there are different defensive options that counter each one. Bloodshots being a multi-hit move means that it's extremely susceptible to strength reduction. Cards like Dark Shackles and Piercing Whale can reduce the heart's strength to the point where each hit does zero, negating the heart's entire turn for a single mana. Of course, this type of defense takes planning to be consistent. You need to have the right card on the right turn, so effects that let you keep cards between turns or search through your deck are valuable. Echo, on the other hand, is such a massive attack that it's pretty unaffected by strength reduction. However, damage prevention effects like Buffer or Fossilized Helix can negate the entire hit. The difficulty here is making sure these effects aren't procced by a Bloodshot, or even worse, a Beat of Death. Of course, when it comes to defending against the heart, Building up a ton of block will be your go-to strategy most of the time. But I love how these two attacks encourage you to think about defense in different ways, and plan for these moves well in advance. If you're going to challenge the heart, it's a good idea to make a plan for how to deal with bloodshots. I'm pretty sure I've died to those 15 red pebbles more than any other move in the game, so as early as Act 2, I start to think about how I'm going to get strength reduction on those key turns. The heart's offense is actually pretty exploitable, and this rewards players who can think 10 steps ahead. Last, let's talk about the heart's most quietly powerful move, buff. Starting on turn 4, and then every 3 turns after that, the heart will gain 2 strength, eliminate any strength reduction, and apply an additional effect. This additional effect starts at a modest 2 artifact on turn 4, and becomes a whopping 50 strength on turn 16. The point of this move is pretty straightforward. If you do nothing but defend, the heart is going to outscale you. It's your responsibility to end the fight before things get out of hand. And if you don't, Bloodshots will deal over 10 times your health total. This is a pretty fair timer, as it forces you to deal significant damage without insisting you hit the cap. To kill the heart by turn 16, you need to deal an average of 50 damage per turn. This is way more than you can do by just stringing together a few upgraded attacks. But as long as you have a consistent plan for how to do the damage, it's perfectly reasonable. Strength, Shield Slam, Poison, Shiv, Barrage, Lightning, Mark... Mantra, Thorns, and many more are all viable strategies for dealing 800 damage in 16 turns. Any well-tuned deck with a solid game plan is able to take down the heart, even if some strategies have an easier time and are easier to put together on your average run. I'm sure that Poison has been my most common heart killer, but I've also beat it with a Meteor Strike, Double Energy, Tempest build. I too was surprised that worked. This fight can be really tough, and losing a run here can be heartbreaking but some of my best times with Slay the Spire were facing the heart after a long rocky run. It's a perfect blend of vicious attacks, devious tricks, and smothering passives that makes each victory feel like an accomplishment. Each of its six unique moves blends perfectly with the rest, creating a memorable encounter that's truly one of the finest fights. Let me know what you think of the corrupt heart in the comments section below. Do you like having a consistent final boss, or would you prefer more randomness, like the Act 3 boss? Also, let me know what boss you think is worthy of a spot in the series. I'm only going to do one fight per game, but I'm sure you all have a lot of ideas from other games. Thanks for watching.